Mental Health Committee and shared widely yesterday. Uh, you may also find them uh, useful as well. So first, I will uh, like to uh, introduce the, the speakers. Uh, Dr. Michael Tian will go first, and he uh, is a psychiatrist in uh, practicing in uh, Halifax uh, at uh, Dalhousie University. Was the head of the Department of Psychiatry at Dalhousie, uh, and was also the head of the Canadian Psychiatric Association, uh, an expert uh, in forensic psychiatry and and all aspects of mental health. Uh, long extensive experience in this area and we thank you Dr. Tian for being with us. And then second after Dr. Tian finishes will be Dr. David Gardner and Dr. David Gardner is a, his doctorate is in, in, in phar pharmacology, pharmacy and uh, is by a pharmacist by, uh, by, by training and uh, a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Dalhousie University and a world-renowned expert in therapeutics, not just um, medications, but all kinds of therapeutics. And he will speak to us a second. So Dr. Tian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stan. <clears throat> um, I don't think I'll ever get used to talking to a, te a television screen or a computer screen, but I'll do my best and uh, hope that we can make this virtual connection about this, uh, this very important topic. This phrase, psychotic episode, unfortunately, is probably has become rather familiar to you uh, through the numerous um, and well-publicized episodes of tragedy involving people with mental illness uh, and uh, their contact with and connect and um, engagement with uh, first responders, particularly police. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the background to all of that um, and. Um, Try to explore some ways forward that may be uh, may be helpful uh, for us all to look at. Uh, Amy, next. Thank you. In connection with this topic or with this talk today, I have no, no conflicts uh, to declare. Next one, Amy. So I thought I'd start with a little story, a true story, um, dating to the late 90s. Uh, it was a Friday evening. Uh, it was a very well-regarded new restaurant had opened in Halifax, and I had just had the first course, which was very enjoyable, myself and my wife, uh, and the telephone rang. Um, and the person on the phone was uh, a superintendent of police from uh, the Halifax Police Service, uh, somebody that I knew quite well. I worked with him as a co-chair of the police liaison committee with mental health. And uh, we'd had a number of meetings where we looked at problems arising between the two services and tried to work out compromises and, and accommodations uh, for each. So we had a very good working relationship, highly respected him. And I thought, of course, he was calling about that work. Uh, in fact, it wasn't that. It was, he told me that uh, a patient that I had been caring for for about a year uh, was engaged in an episode, um, a very serious violent episode, and uh, he was seeking my help uh, to, to uh, assist the police who were dealing with, with it. Um, so what happened was uh, my patient who walked into a medical clinic based in a suburb of, of Halifax, um, and he had a gun. <clears throat> he ordered out to all the patients and most of the staff, but he kept a small number of hostages. Um, several of them were um, were doctors and uh, some other medical, other med, uh, 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 clinical staff as well, nurses predominantly. Um, so R Ron asked me if I would go to the site where this was happening and see if I could offer any help to the team, the SWAT team, uh, who were assembled there and trying to deal with the, with, uh, the situation, uh, which I did. And uh, when I arrived, I found uh, the SWAT team had placed a, a barrier around the entrance to the building. The, um, the, the clinic was on the first floor of, of um, the main floor, rather, of the high-rise apartment building. Um, and so that entrance was blocked off. Uh, there was a telephone connection to the patient and the negotiator was dealing uh, back and forth with, uh, with the patient. 
I fully expected that he would ask me to um, leverage my my relationship uh, with the patient to try and talk him down or de-escalate the situation and hopefully get him to uh, surrender. Uh, that wasn't actually what they wanted. They, they were very confident in their own skills. These trained negotiators had uh, been very well prepared for such uh, uh, eventualities and they were going to handle this themselves. What they wanted from me was um, what I knew of the patient, in particular what the um, potential for danger might be, uh, in other words, whether he might in fact uh, be capable of going carrying on with his, um, uh, or, or carrying out the uh, threat to harm the people inside. Um, briefly, the background is that he, um, uh, not yet, thanks, he, he was um, diagnosed with schizophrenia several years earlier and had a fairly um, quiet course until recently, at which point he became convinced that um, a number of people that he stayed overnight with had infected him with syphilis. Uh, this was a delusion, um, fixed false belief that uh, any amount of persuasion could not um, get him to abandon. He had, against my wishes, he had gone to several specialists in Halifax, extensive testing, all of which, of course, was negative, but uh, that in no way convinced him that, uh, that he was wrong. <clears throat> so the point of his exercise that evening was he wanted to have some esoteric test, I think uh, a particular kind of MRI, which in his belief system he thought would, would uh, show that this had happened and then he would receive appropriate treatment. <clears throat> Um, so I outlined to the SWAT team my assessment of his danger, which I did not think was high, but I had been terribly surprised by his action. So I, I certainly had no great confidence in that and gave them the, an understanding of what his issues were. Um, in the end, over many, many hours, they, they solved the situation uh, peacefully. Uh, he did surrender uh, and uh, was arrested and was later found not criminally responsible for his actions by reason of mental disorder, uh, was in the forensic um, treatment system for about 15 years after that. So that's kind of a, a story that I will return to uh, towards the end of today's talk to look at some of the things that it points up in our dealings with such crisis situations for people with mental illness and uh, lead me to some thoughts on how best we can, we can address those. Uh, next one, Amy. Uh, here's uh, an excerpt from a speech that uh, Beverly McLaughlin, who was at that time Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, um, and in it, as you'll see, she she was uh, she reports having a dinner um, at which the um, commander of the precinct, police precinct in Toronto, was sitting beside her. Uh, and she asked him, um, you know, to make conversation, what were the, the major issues facing police as he saw it, uh, expecting that it would be, you know, this soft judges letting people out before they should and uh, charter making everybody um, impossible to prosecute and so on. Um, to her surprise, he said, you know, the main problem is uh, his force dealing with mental illness, patients with mental illness day in and day out and their perception that they were ill-suited to doing so, but there was no alternative, um, and the frustrations and difficulties this was posing, uh, which seemed to be increasing. Uh, next slide. And just to emphasize that, I've got some data that was published by um, the Huffington Post Canada. Uh, the main author was Samantha Beatty, uh, and then several others. Uh, recently published. Next one, Amy. What she had done was she approached all the um, police services in Canada in the, in the major cities, the largest ones, uh, with RCMP, which I hope this is large enough for you to see, but it's um, it shows the number of mental health calls that RCMP received between 2013, I can't even make it out, and 2019. And the point, as you can see, is there's about a 50% increase 
throughout the country over the entire service of the RCMP in mental health calls in that time, which is an astonishing um, increase. And in the lower graph, you'll see that this is um, the case in BC, Alberta, uh, and uh, right across the country, smaller, of course, in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Next one, Amy. And in the Northern Territories, we have the same issue, and uh, there have been highly publicized cases in, in uh, the North, as you know, recently, but uh, doubling the caseload, in, or the number of calls, rather, uh, that were received by RCMP um, over these last years. Uh, next one. And she also contacted municipal uh, police services. Um, there are, I think, six of them here, five of them here. Um, other cities uh, either didn't keep stats in the format that they could use for comparison, and several of them demanded that she do a freedom of information uh, request in order to release. So these are the data that she could get. And, and again, the pattern is very clear across all of the services. Um, significant increases in the number of calls that police services are receiving to deal with mental health crisis. Next one, Amy. And here's a somewhat disturbing um, addition to that data. So here is Toronto Police Service, which again shows a 50% increase in the years of the survey. Uh, but if you go to the lower um, part of the graph, you see these are the crisis response team uh, and their, the number that they were able to respond to in those years as the graph was climbing. And as you'll see, there, it's a flat curve. They, they haven't been able to increase uh, their responsiveness during that time. The next one, Amy. And similarly in Vancouver, uh, which is a very well-developed um, crisis response combined uh, police and, and mental health service, uh, they have not been able to, it looks like they tried in 2015 and 16 uh, to try and increase, but uh, that's tailed off again. So, so the message is that the police forces uh, across municipal and and uh, national services are being uh, asked to deal with an, an ever-increasing number of these calls. Um, and our, our health care system and, and uh, response services are not uh, keeping pace with, the, uh, with, with those calls. Next one, Amy. So our objectives today are to um, talk a little bit about and it's a very short time I have, but just to give a brief uh, overview of the severe and persistent mental illnesses, um, outlines some of the main characteristics. I have a couple of cases that are illustrative of each of the major uh, mental illnesses we'll talk about um, and, and um, examine possibilities for improving the handling of those cases towards the end. Let me start with what psychosis is not. Although it's often loosely used by commentators and writers as, as simply somebody who's extremely angry or ranting, this is, that is not psychosis. Uh, nor is it psychosis when communities share odd ideas. There are some extreme religious groups, um, people who believe in the paranormal, the flat earth and so on. Uh, you might even say some of the political uh, groupings to our, and our neighbors to the south might be included here. These are not this is not psychosis, nor is delirium, which is a, a brief uh, interruption in people's contact with the reality when they're very ill, especially among the elderly, uh, often in a hospital setting. None of these things is, is psychosis. What it is, is a, is a set of diverse mental and emotional experiences and behaviors uh, organized around the principle of a loss of contact with reality. Um, and I might even add to that, it's, it's that People in the throes of psychosis occupy a different reality uh, to those around them. It's defined differently, uh, um, but, but with that same principle always borne in mind that it's a loss of contact with reality. Here are just some samples of a disorder in which thought and emotions are so impaired that contact is lost with external reality. Another one is a mental disorder characterized by disconnection from reality, resulting in strange behavior often accompanied by perception of stimuli, voices, images, and so on. And then from the um, 
Center for Addictions and Mental Health in Toronto. Uh, the one I probably like best, the word psychosis is used to describe the conditions that affect the mind in which people have, a tr have trouble distinguishing between what is real and what is not. And when this occurs, <clears throat> it's called a psychotic episode. <clears throat> and then for those of us who practice in this profession, the Bible is the DSM-5, and it defines psychotic disorders as abnormalities in one or more of five domains. These are delusions, hallucinations, disorganized thinking, grossly disorganized or abnormal behavior, uh, and negative, <coughs> negative symptoms. <clears throat> I'm going to speak about four of those five because um, negative symptoms really don't factor in to crisis for the most part. Um, so delusions are um, fixed false beliefs. Um, they can vary greatly in, in their content uh, they often contain persecutory ideas, but they can uh, be centered on uh, relationship issues where there's a, an erotic component. Um, they can sometimes be harmless. Um, a teacher of mine in Dublin had a, a patient who, who believed that um, uh, there was a little man in her colon who attended to her daily need to evacuate the colon, and she called him Seamus and was quite content to have him there. Um, and from that extreme to the other extreme, well, like the, the patient I described earlier, who engaged in uh, potentially fatal um, activity around his, his uh, delusional belief. Hallucinations refer to uh, stimulation of our senses by something that isn't there. So the most common of these, of course, are, are voices, which are held, heard uh, by people suffering from mental illness very commonly, uh, but visual, uh, taste, smell, uh, or touching uh, sensations can also occur uh, uh, less commonly. Disorganized thoughts and speech are quite difficult to describe, uh, but when you experience them, they're very, they're very striking. So people, um, again, there are several different uh, patterns of, of these uh, disturbances of thoughts and speech. Um, most often it's uh, people who go off on tangents to whatever the, the topic uh, the, the, that was being discussed is um, in in manic depression there can be very um, something called flight of ideas where where one idea after another chases uh, the, through the person's mind and is expressed very often very loudly and very volubly um, and uh, other patterns also exist and then I think you'll all be familiar with observing uh, if you live in a, in a large city in Canada disorganized behavior of the mentally ill uh, and abnormal behavior with people dressed oddly um, uh, with uh, uh, patterns of behavior where they're talking to themselves, sometimes shouting, um, so extremes of, of this uh, abnormal behavior. Apologies, that's my phone going. Uh, next one, Amy. So, so there are I think 157 diagnoses in DSM, uh, and I'm going to speak about two of them because uh, those two account for far and away majority of, uh, of crises that occur um, in the community and that police and, and other first responders have to deal with. Uh, so in very brief, manic depressive illness, uh, more recently called bipolar disorder, uh, is a disorder where there are, there's a mood elevation on one pole, um, and on the other pole, there's a, a depression. Um, the mood elevation is characterized by a euphoric mood most often, but sometimes this verges into um, extreme irritability and with behaviors uh, associated with that irritability. Um, with depression, uh, very few crises tend to occur with, in that pole except that people do, of course, uh, in the depths of depression, sometimes engage in suicidal behavior, and sometimes completion, unfortunately. Uh, so most crises with uh, bipolar disorder are with the manic phase. Uh, people affected have, are often have, have them grossly exaggerated ideas of their self-worth. They, they own banks. They, um, they've been chosen by God to, to uh, 
carry out a task. Um, they show extreme loss of judgment. Um, they're going to spend huge amounts of money that they don't have uh, uh, to engage in disinhibited sexual behavior and other extremes of behavior. Um, their speech is often, as I mentioned, uh, disjointed. Uh, they show these, these rapid thoughts which they express volubly uh, and moving from topic to topic in uh, sometimes almost impossible to follow manner. Um, and unlike schizophrenia, which I'll describe in a moment, uh, the classic disorder of, of um, bipolar disorder allows for the person when they're uh, treated and sometimes even without treatment uh, to return to their normal state. And in between episodes, they, they uh, do not have a continuing uh, disability related to the disorder. Schizophrenia, on the other hand, um, tends to also occur in episodes, uh, but unfortunately, most people who suffer from it uh, remain disabled after their, epi their acute episode has uh, finished. Um, and they tend to have a more prolonged, continuous course uh, than bipolar disorder. Hallucinations are particularly common, uh, especially voices. Uh, and they, there are delusions which are often quite bizarre, um, beliefs that um, chips have been inserted in their brain to cause them to uh, understand the things that the rest of us do not understand. Uh, feelings that they're part of uh, a movie, uh, that everything that's happening in their life is actually being filmed and, and uh, broadcast. Um, their thoughts are often hard to follow. Uh, they, in, at one end of the poll, they, they don't um, express themselves very much. They say very little. Uh, at, at another extreme, they have what's called word salad, where uh, although they speak in what appear to be sentences, the words are thrown together in a, a salad so that they have no actual um, explanatory meaning and uh, they're impossible to follow. That's a, at an extreme end. Uh, and again, that people tend to remain disabled even when the acute episodes are finished. So let me give you a case example of each of those. Go ahead, Amy. Look at Bill. Um, so Bill, I first met when he was about 45 to 50. Um, he lived in the rural part of Nova Scotia. He was a well-respected local businessman. He had uh, an extensive operation, um, about 10 employees, uh, and with um, business throughout the province, he traveled a great deal. He had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder in his 30s. <clears throat> um, and uh, when he was treated, as I said, he, he came back fully to his normal self. Um, unfortunately, as, as often happens uh, in these long-term illnesses, he uh, began to doubt the, the validity of his diagnosis. Um, and whenever he did have episodes, and he did have many, um, he would blame the fact that he had used um, substances and, that, and came to believe that if he, if he simply avoided substances he'd remained well. Um, so there had been numerous uh, episodes where he'd had to be readmitted to hospital and medication restarted and then he would stop again. Uh, he was well, very well known to local police who often responded to um, his behavior when, when he was unwell. Next one. And what uh, brought me in contact with him was he, he um, in one of these episodes when he had been off medication for some time and abusing substances, uh, he began to uh, utter threats that he would kill police officers uh, in a neighboring province. It was never completely clear what his um, grievance was, but uh, he, was, he was very pointed and did in fact set out in his truck, um, drove a long distance and boarded a ferry. Um, he, he had been so uh, vocal in his threats that um, the services had been alerted and he was met when he arrived in the neighboring province and arrested uh, where he was floridly ill. Um, but the police there did find an arsenal of weapons. Uh, so uh, he was deemed to have been very dangerous in, this, in that state. Uh, he was found not criminally responsible and uh, 
was um, for a number of years then in the forensic system where uh, he did return to normal, although he had some relapses uh, and he remained um, essentially improved over a number of years. Next one. And this was a patient of mine uh, called Hank. Uh, he was about 27 when I met him, had been diagnosed a number of years earlier with schizophrenia. He lived in a trailer park in Halifax, uh, not the one that's uh, featured on television, um, with what I can only call a saint, his mother, who um, lived with him uh, and cared for him through thick and thin. He had um, a very tumultuous course. Uh, he, he had numerous crises uh, involving the police having to be called and to bring him to hospital. Um, some very traumatic um, experiences like that. On one occasion, he hid under a bed in the, in the um, trailer and we had to drag him out and his family watching and handcuff him and um, left the family very, um, uh, very much affected by, by what happened. Uh, he again did not believe he was ill um, uh, and often refused medication, even long acting injectable medication, which is one of our go-tos and David will talk about that a little later, um, but he often refused. And then one morning uh, I had a call from a Crown Prosecutor who was in a courtroom in downtown Halifax. Hank had um, called a neighbor, a young woman who he barely knew and she hardly knew him. They just passed each other in the street, uh, threatening to kill her because he had developed a delusional belief that uh, she was uh, uh, plotting to harm him in some unknown way. Um, so the prosecutor, knowing that he was ill uh, and trying to avoid getting him into the court system, asked if we would admit, uh, which we did. And then it turned into a very good story because we had available at that time for the first time a drug called clozapine. Uh, and again, David will probably tell you more about that. Uh, it was, I think, my first patient to use the drug in and it would, had a dramatic effect. Um, so Hank lived peacefully playing his guitar with his very caring mother and family uh, until I retired from that practice 18 years later. Next one. So turning back to the night in Halifax, um, there were certain things that I took away from it. Um, first of all, not to labor the point, but people with mental illness can become threatening or violent. I should I should uh, issue a caveat here that the vast majority of people with mental illness are much more likely to be vulnerable to um, violence and mistreatment than to cause it. But it does happen. And uh, these are the kind of, of situations where first responders are called to, to deal with. Um, to emphasize again that people who are in a psychotic state um, are not operating in the same reality that those around them are. They're operating to uh, a different drummer. They're following a line of logic or reasoning that, that is not um, accessible to the rest of us. Uh, and that can lead them to quite um, extreme actions. Uh, and that has to be taken into account by, um, by the people who are responding. First responders need to understand that uh, they are they're not likely to obtain um, uh, cooperation by the usual ways that they use uh, when they're tackling somebody who is angry or uh, intoxicated, that, the, that the, it, is, it is a different situation and they, we have to accommodate to those circumstances. The other is that even extreme uh, crises can be de-escalated using the right means uh, and that we have to learn from uh, the situations where, where uh, there has been difficulty, how to make that possible. To, to my mind, the linchpin of, of uh, how to deal with these crises is to have a close working relationship between uh, the police services and mental health services of an area or a city. Um, combining mental health and police resources is, is optimal. Um, they can both bring to to the uh, activity, their own set of skills and their own uh, experiences um, and their own knowledge. 
uh, and they can help each other to make uh, uh, a better outcome for these um, unfortunate situations. And my other conclusion is that, uh, as I'll speak about in a moment, not enough is being done uh, to, to use this um, kind of resource. So uh, when Stan, Dr. Kutcher, was uh, head of the department in Halifax in the late 90s, I was his uh, clinical director and we had a, a very um, effective uh, health authority leader as well. And we worked to, uh, to actually set up this kind of service in Halifax. Uh, pretty well, I think, ahead of the curve uh, in, in Canada, one, one of the early adopters of, uh, of this approach. Um, so we set up um, a dedicated telephone crisis line which could be accessed by the patient, by their families, by um, caregivers, by group home uh, individuals looking after patients, by anybody who had a crisis on their hands. Um, and in addition, there was a mobile unit set up uh, of um, mental health uh, clinicians, mainly nurses and social workers, uh, and a police officer who had received additional um, training in mental health, uh, a volunteer police officer, my dad, those uh, who had an interest uh, could obtain this, this additional training and then could come combined in the, uh, in the response team. Um, pitiful is the only way I can describe how we were funded initially. We were only able to uh, operate um, towards the weekends, I think Wednesday to Sunday, uh, for limited hours, uh, which were chosen by the number of, um, by the emergency rooms reporting of the number of cases they would see during particular hours. Uh, and so, and we covered only the cities of Halifax and, uh, and uh, Dartmouth, leaving large swaths of the province unattended. Um, that, that service proved itself essential very quickly. Uh, and with that did flow more funding. Uh, so it's now in, I would say vastly expanded. It serves the province uh, for telephone inquiries or for, for telephone responses. It's expanded greatly the, the range for which um, we can deploy the, uh, the, the mobile units. Um, but again, we have a long way to go. Next one, Amy. Um, so as you see, the data suggests that uh, even larger cities do not have the, the um, availability of, of, um, of services that can respond more fulsomely to these calls. Uh, so we need to do more to ensure that all of our um, communities uh, are able to be served by, by this kind of, of service. Um, I don't need to emphasize that there, there have been incredibly tragic interventions by um, uh, it, it, people who are not really prepared for what they were having to deal with. And this is not a criticism of those people. If you're not trained, if you don't have the knowledge, um, people are, are um, uh, do the best they can in difficult circumstances. Um, but we do have, and it's not, it's not by any means uh, rocket science to, to say that we have a model that exists now across the world. A, a recent review said there are about a thousand of these uh, combined mental health and, and uh, police teams in operation. Um, what we do need is the political will, and particularly I'm speaking to the audience here, to, uh, to look at the funding for expanding and, and making more comprehensive uh, this kind of very effective uh, response. With that, I thank you. Uh, for attending, for your interest in this issue, which is close to me. Um, and I'm happy to hear any comments uh, or respond to any questions that you have. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tian. Uh, very appreciate um, uh, the wisdom and the information uh, and the complexities uh, of this particular issue, but also the awareness that uh, there are solutions that can help and that uh, we all have to be uh, cognizant of those solutions and work towards them. So thank you very much. And again, if you have questions, um, you can just pop, pop them in the chat bar and I'll uh, try to deal with them as they come up.
Um, now I just ask uh, Dr. David Gardner, who I previously introduced, to uh, come on and talk about treatment. Dr. Gardner. There I am. I've got my microphone on and I'm trying to share my screen. I think you can see my screen stand. You want to just give me a heads up if you can see it. I can see I can see your screen uh, and um, I there. think it's there you are. Now I can see it much better. Okay. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Good. Uh, thanks, Dan, for inviting me to participate um, uh, to talk about uh, treatments for mental illness. Uh, I will not actually be going into the details of individual treatments per se, but more bring sort of a review of the concepts of treatment. And there's really four key questions that I hope to cover today, which is what constitute, constitutes an effective treatment for mental illness? What's the treatment for? How do we know if a treatment works? And what do we do when the treatment doesn't seem to be working? So starting off with what constitutes an effective treatment, Stan mentioned at the start that I'm a pharmacist. And so you'd um, be right if you thought I might talk a lot about um, medicines in uh, my career. That's what I tend to do a lot. But uh, that would really be a disservice if I was going to say that's what we talk about when it comes to managing mental illness. Um, so here I just wanted to exemplify when when I'm thinking of treatments, I'm thinking much broader than um, <laughs> med medicines themselves and going beyond that. So uh, it might be a form of psychotherapy. Um, where you see a therapist, or it might be a self-help approach, for example, an online cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, other treatments are more um, system-wide, if you will, where we're thinking uh, social interventions, um, the uh, uh, determinants of health, and uh, optimizing um, people who live with mental illness to remain stable or to avoid uh, the development of mental illness through uh, social interventions. Uh, then there's uh, other uh, forms of treatment, whether it's uh, ECT as a way to um, affect brain activity, recreation therapy, where there's group therapy um, and peer support. Again, also where you're working with people who have lived experience of mental illness, which is critically important. Um, and, and then other forms, I, I spend a fair amount of my time actually um, participating as an invited speaker for support groups, whether it be the Schizophrenia Society or others, people coming together. And I find that they've asked me to come and help them learn more about medicines, but I tend to learn an awful lot of what it's like to live with uh, different mental illnesses in our society across Canada when I attend those kinds of support groups. And so I just wanted to make sure that we were thinking broadly when it comes to uh, thinking about the treatments for mental illness. And uh, we tend to focus our uh, resources um, on management of uh, acute illnesses. And uh, Dr. Tian uh, described a few examples of where those um, resources come into play. But I also wanted to make sure we don't forget um, the large uh, circle, the blue circle, which is the prevention of mental illness, uh, where we're really thinking about, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the social determinants of health, or in this case, mental health. So thinking about the reduction of poverty, increasing the availability of housing, uh, especially to those who are the most uh, uh, discriminated against or uh, stigmatized in our society, as well as providing other things like um, services or structures to ensure healthy child development. Those are the kind of things that will have downstream effects for reducing um, the, the burden of mental illness on our society. And then there's the in-between. There's um, those people who have a mental illness and are living with a mental illness. And we often talk about them, especially for those who live with mental illness in that community, talk about recovery. So uh, they have a chronic illness um, and sometimes what we're thinking about is the prevention of recurrences. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through as well. Are the treatments that we have for mental illness on par with the treatments that we have for physical illnesses? And, and this has been demonstrated to be the case. Here, this is um, a study looking at a wide range of interventions, medication interventions for physical illnesses, as well as for mental illnesses. The ones representing mental illnesses are on the right. Um, so this is uh, demonstrating that the higher you go, the more effective it is 
uh, across individuals and also for the individual themselves. So you can see that some stretch near the top of this uh, range where they're very effective across different individuals and for the individual themselves, and some um, well down closer to the bottom indicating they're not particularly effective. And if you compare the closed circles, the blue circles with the open circles, you can see that the uh, the medicines for mental illness and the medicines for physical illnesses really span a similar range of um, either not causing things to be worse to being markedly better somewhere or somewhere in between. So that's kind of on average um, the effectiveness across individuals, for example, using antipsychotics. Uh, Michael had mentioned clozapine for every four people who have treatment refractory schizophrenia, one person will be a robust responder to clozapine. And if you compare this with our use of, for example, blood pressure pills for people who have high blood pressure and no other risk factors, we would need to treat over 100 people to prevent one episode of a stroke, a heart attack, or death from a cardiovascular event. So we have a wide range of effectiveness within psychiatric meds as well as within uh, medications for physical illness. And when we look within the individual, we see that there is also a range. So people are familiar with the um, bell curve or the Gaussian curve here. You know, the medicines that uh, Health Canada approves for mental illness, you know, they work on average um, better than no treatment at all. But for some people, they work tremendously well, and for other people, they are not um, effective and we try different medications. So the range here really goes from a complete and rapid resolution on the right, where symptoms have dramatically improved and functioning has returned quickly. And far on the left, the person started the same medicine, a different person started the same medicine, and instead of getting better, they just experienced side effects and therefore wouldn't stay on that medicine and would switch to something else. So there is inter-individual differences among the same medicines for the same uh, diagnoses, if you will. When we think of our options, we tend to um, prioritize them. Uh, first line, second line, and third line. When we um, look a little bit deeper, we look at the um, diagnosis itself and often we rate it based on its severity. So the treatment options that we will give as first line for people who have mild to moderate symptoms of an illness may not actually be the same options that we would, will give to individuals who have moderate to severe versions of that same illness. And this really has to do with risk. If somebody has more severe illness, and we are going to give them a medicine, um, we want to make sure it's effective and it's possible that it has a higher risk. So for example, we may reserve uh, medicines that have uh, significant side effects um, for people who are the most severely ill, but if they have a mild or moderate um, uh, episode, then we may avoid medicines altogether and go with a psychotherapeutic approach, for example. To be first line, you really need to be based on um, evidence that demonstrates uh, high effectiveness, is safe, is accessible to Canadians across the country, and the quality of the evidence is high. And I'll actually talk a fair bit about how do we know that the quality of evidence is strong. Second line agents don't meet all of those requirements. Maybe the medicine, for example, is less safe or uh, less accessible or the evidence quality itself is lower. And then third line agents are those maybe even uh, lower in terms of one or several of those uh, categories. What's the treatment actually doing? Why are we uh, providing treatment? So when it comes to psychiatric illnesses or mental illness, uh, cure is really not the goal. Uh, we don't have uh, gene therapies uh, to try to uh, improve uh, the individual's lives. And I don't anticipate that we will have uh, these kind of things in the uh, um, near future. So really what it's about is reducing burden. The goal is to help people um, reduce uh, what they're experiencing in terms of their mental illness across the lifespan. So I've illustrated this with three individuals across um, their teenage years, 
until they're closing in on retirement. In the first one, you see that uh, the person has sort of what we call an episodic course where there's three distinct periods of illness. And if we introduce a treatment, we may not get it right the first time. It may be introduced later into the episode because it took some time for the individual either to come to attention or it wasn't recognized immediately as a mental illness, which can be a difficulty. Um, but in the second case, um, the treatment might be might intervene right away because the person recognizes it for what's happening. And if these things happen, then instead of the course being what was shown in blue earlier, uh, the treatments have effect, an effect on reducing the intensity of symptoms and the duration of symptoms. Similarly, with the second case, it may be that the treatment is initiated in the first um, episode during the teenage years and there's a quiescent period thereafter, and then it recurs later on, and it's the type of illness where daily use of medication or injectable medication where um, you take a dose every month, for example, with certain types of antipsychotics for the treatment of schizophrenia, uh, the person stays on that for many years. And again, it reduces the burden of illness and gives uh, longer periods of stability. And in the third case, you can see that the level of illness, the duration of illness and the severity of the illness is greater than the first two cases. It may be that we need to change the medicines around or change the intervention itself. For example, giving electroconvulsive therapy or ECT at some point, and then maybe the pharmacotherapy, the longstanding treatment itself, um, goes for quite a while, minimizing symptoms, improving functioning over time, allowing the person to uh, develop relationships, complete training, have a job, and do well, even though they're living with mental illness, having some, some symptoms and some impairment of their functioning. And then in their, into their 40s, in this case, they actually decide, since I've been doing so well, I'll try life without any of these treatments, have a period of quiescence, but again, with a recurrence, maybe try something different, and then have some period where, because of the relapse, uh, they're living with signs and symptoms of mental illness, some decrease in their functioning, but over time things improve. So it's really about reducing burden. And we do have sort of a common language across um, the different treatments that we use. So um, when people are doing well, we may use words like they're well or they're stable or they're recovered from their previous episodes. But as they descend into a new episode, we may, and, and Michael used the term episodes quite often, we may use the term episode related clinical deterioration. If it's the first time that they're being seen in um, psychiatric care, mental health clinic, for example, uh, they need to cross a certain threshold to be diagnosed as having a, men a mental illness. And then um, they, if, if they do uh, descend or deteriorate into this um, period, it's uh, unclear how long it'll be before they actually uh, receive treatment. So assertive um, um, availability of psychiatric uh, illness, whether it's provided by primary care providers, family doctors and otherwise, or uh, specialty clinics and so forth, can be, can be difficult. Very often there's a stigma against bringing people to care when to talk about mental illness. This may be cultural or it may, may be for other reasons. Um, so there can be a delay in treatment initiation. When treatment is initiated, uh, we use the term response when things are going in the right direction. Response doesn't mean it's cured. It means that things have improved. The goal of treatment is to achieve remission, a remission of symptoms and a return of regular day-to-day -day functioning. And then at that point, when the person is doing well, they are at risk, at higher risk than the general population of experiencing a relapse, or if it's much later, we'll use the term recurrence. Or uh, they may do well and experience recovery from their previous episode. The word recovery is also used in the community um, of people who live with mental illness as something that is their journey. They've been diagnosed with mental illness, they live with mental illness, and they are in recovery from mental illness. And so that recovery is really seen as something that happens over a long period of time with all of life's, life's ups and downs. Next thing I'm going to talk about is how it's important to align um, the goals of therapy 
uh, so that everybody understands what to expect from the treatment itself and at the same time what to what not to expect uh, that the treatment will be able to do. And I thought I would just uh, introduce this with a quick story about an excellent doctor, a boy with ticks and his parents with hopes and a very effective medication. This boy was referred to a specialist um, and the family went to see the specialist and in walked the doctor to, to meet with the boy and do the assessment and to chat with the family. And it didn't take long for the specialist to understand what the boy's problem was and come up with what the specialist thought would be quite an effective solution. So he wrote a prescription, told uh, the young man that he thought it would be very helpful and same with the family and sent them off to the pharmacy. And a few weeks later, returned to see the specialist. And the specialist coming back from lunch saw the family in the waiting room and gave them a quick nod. Noticed that the boys. Dr. Gardner, you've muted, unfortunately. When did I mute? uh from at the point of the waiting room okay the waiting room okay so they entered into the uh the specialist's office um and instead of receiving praise and gratitude from the family and the young the young boy uh, about um the improvement in symptoms both were disgrunt disgruntled the family the parents were quite unhappy that the boy even though his ticks were so much better was still not taking the garbage out and the boy was very unhappy because at school, none of the girls were talking to him. And um, I just thought I would share that because um, the specialist is here online with us. And it was an experience uh, where um, it was a learning moment for everybody that it's really important to share. What will the treatments be able to offer and what might they not be able to offer? And on the next slide, I just wanted to make it clear that what we do with psychiatric treatments is really not unlike what we do with physical treatments. We identify the targets of the symptoms and the day to day functioning, whether, for example, it's an anxiety disorder, schizophrenia or rheumatoid arthritis, what the treatments are, what the options are for the individuals and making those selections in an informed way identifying what the treatment goals are, making sure that those treatment goals are shared and uh, understanding when to expect benefits and how long to, that treatment will continue to make sure people understand that it's not like an antibiotic, it's not like Tylenol. These are things that we get started. We work together to make sure we find the right dose, we find the right medication and so forth. And how do we know if it's actually working? Sometimes that is easier to determine and sometimes it's quite difficult to identify. So in cases where uh, symptoms are obvious, the um, functioning is significantly deteriorated, we can again discuss what those symptoms are, what the treatment is expected to do, how long it should take for improvement to occur, the, uh, what happens in between while we're waiting for those kind of symptoms. And when we have a team for monitoring, the most important person in monitoring for improvement is obviously the person taking the medication and sometimes it's the family observing how things have been moving along um, and with follow up with the rest of the team, the physician, the pharmacist, the nurse and so forth, monitoring for improvement of symptoms and functioning, but also for side effects and acceptance. Are you taking the uh, treatment? Are you adhering to the treatment and using it as has been intended for you to use it? Very often in those cases, it's quite straightforward to determine if the medicine or the other form of treatment of psychotherapy or otherwise is actually working. But it's really difficult if the um, treatment itself is much more complex and far reaching and involves not just more individuals, but involves more systems per se. For example, with the implementation of a multi-dimensional suicide prevention program, this can involve community, healthcare providers, educational systems, justice, and so on and so forth. Uh, the infrastructure of a city itself can be changed based on the um, program itself. So how do we know it's working when suicide itself is such a rare outcome? 11 of 100,000 Canadians on average die per year 
in relation to suicide. It's a very rare event in our society. There are lots of different treatments, if you will, or interventions or programs that suggest that they are suicide preventing programs. Do they reduce the number of people who die from suicide or do they reduce the attempts? Or is it thoughts? Thoughts are not a great predictor of attempts. Attempts are not a great predictor of deaths. What they tend to measure is the person who has been trained, if they are more willing to provide care to somebody in a suicidal crisis, which is not a predictor of thought, a reduction in thoughts, attempts, or suicide. For the next two slides, I thought I would challenge you to see if you could come up with what would be considered to be a first line therapy compared to what would be considered to be an, a non evidence based therapy. So in the first one, uh, something called Risper Risperdal, the advertisement here says from psychotic to cool, calm and collected. And the second one is um, a book a book titled EMDR, The Breakthrough Therapy for Overcoming Anxiety, Stress and Trauma. And the third one is Homeopathy Treatment for Schizophrenia. The author of uh, the homeopathy states the following, schizophrenia patients having delusions of persecution and grandiose delusions respond well if radium bromide at 10 molar or 50 molar potency is administered. I don't know if you want to put your answers into the uh, the comments. Uh, I don't have that up right now. Now I do. Let's see what people are saying. No answers yet. Nobody wants to jump in. Will it surprise you if I tell you that Risperdal, which is Risperidone, which is an antipsychotic, is first line therapy? for the treatment of schizophrenia and helps an awful lot of people go from an acute episode to doing very well getting back to school or their jobs and living what can be uh, next to a very normal life or um, somebody without any symptoms at all. Let's see how you do with the next one. There's three up here for you to think about. Some, a book called Sink Into Sleep and it's said on the website, based on decades of research, it is now known that the most effective program for the reversal of chronic insomnia is called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. The second one is a book written by Cheryl Peregrine and a foreword by an MD called Healing with Cannabis. And on the website, it says how medical cannabis helps treat a range of illnesses, maybe all of them. And then, oh, I jumped ahead. And then the last one is from a website uh, called Living Works, uh, and this website um, provides information about their education programs for suicide intervention training. And it says it's shown by major studies to be significantly, significantly reduce suicidality. Their specific program called ASSIST uh, teaches effective intervention skills. So I gave you the answer. I'm sorry, took, took away the surprise, but this book is actually um, based on CBTI. CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, is recommended by the American College of Physicians, the European uh, Research Society, and so on and so forth, experts around the world as the treatment, first line treatment for chronic insomnia. And they also recommend to use sleeping pills as second line therapy only after CBTI works. Private health care plans and um, public health care plans in Canada pay for sleeping pills and they don't pay for CBTI. So it's a very unusual situation that we are paying for the second line therapy and not the first line therapy through our um, taxes or our contributions to our private insurance. So I mentioned the term evidence based a couple of times. So what is evidence based? So here's a study. Um, showing results of using calm face mist over eight weeks. And if this was done um, in university students, this would provide evidence that over eight weeks, using calm face mist every morning reduces uh, stress and anxiety. Symptom severity goes down. So uh, this could be published in a reputable uh, journal. 
medical journal and uh, on the website where COM is being sold, they could say it's been published in a reputable journal and that students at university can use it to reduce their stress with the implication that if you weren't using it, you would continue to have uh, more severe symptoms of anxiety and stress. But what you really need is a study that has a second group in which the other group gets something that looks like this um, intervention, which is a face mist. So I was trying to think what would be a good face mist, face mist that's a placebo, and I thought, well, I guess water. Just call it mist. Maybe the second one could be called mist. So calm face mist versus mist. And it wouldn't surprise you that there would be, for example, if this study was done in April through to May of 2020, there would be a significant high level of anxiety in university students that by the time May or June rolled around would be significantly reduced. So it was not the face mist, the calm face mist at all that was improving symptoms. So research evidence, that is evidence itself. If it was just that study with the one arm, so to speak, um, it exists in many forms. What varies is the validity of the evidence itself. So I thought I'll go quickly through what helps us know if something is working based on the quality of the research itself. So we have a population of people and we should have a representative sample. So randomly selecting people from that population. We have assessments planned in advance so that we are able to measure what needs to be measured so that we're measuring important outcomes. For example, if we're doing a study of depression, we could do a blood test of cortisol and show that the cortisol levels went down over time, indicating a reduction in stress. But we could also use validated scales to assess depression itself, or we can evaluate people's time to return to work or their social functioning or otherwise. We can measure their risk for suicide or attempts at suicide and plan those kind of things in advance. We also should plan in advance what treatments are going to be compared and what intensity or duration those treatments are to ensure that what is being given is an adequate and fair trial of the new treatment as well as the comparison. When we allocate people to groups, we shouldn't be able to just pick and choose who we want to go into the groups, but it should be absolutely random and we should assess their outcomes without knowing what group they are in so that we have in the end two groups that are actually comparable with the only difference being the intervention or the treatment itself. So just to exemplify this with an example, um, sorry, with de individuals with depression and chronic insomnia, people are randomly selected and then uh, each individual participant is randomly allocated to go into one group or the other. So here we have group one where it's the intervention in group two where there is no treatment, but they're treated otherwise exactly the same over time. There's three assessments, for example. Uh, the people doing the assessments do not know which group you're actually in, so they're called what we call blinded assessors. And this, in the end, gives us a valid comparison of the intervention itself, whatever it be, psychotherapy, a self-help approach, or uh, otherwise uh, compared to treatment as usual. And in many cases, that means nothing different than what you would normally do, whether it's seeing a physician or otherwise. What I can tell you, it's been shown over and over and over again. The level of quality is correlated with the findings of effectiveness. If you have very low quality research, it tends to show things to be exceptionally effective. When you actually take out all of the biases in the study design, it tends to show that the effect is much smaller than the claim, the original claims based on poor quality data are. The last thing I'll mention is what do we do if treatment does not seem to be working? Uh, just kind of a, a, a explain here that the vast majority of people who have a mental illness are taken care of by the primary care health system. So that's often seeing family physicians or nurse practitioners, 
going to the pharmacy to talk with the pharmacist about the medications that have been prescribed and some other things that you might be able to do that are non-pharmacologic to help you with your, your mental health. And for sure, self-care approaches that um, you've been advised by others to access or identified on, on your own. First line therapies are what tend to be used in primary care is, um, is the focus. And if the first one doesn't work, you might move over to the second or even to the third. For more complex cases or where the first line therapies really don't work, we have people referred to um, really more complex uh, versions or systems of care. So we call it team-based mental health services. And if you see the triangle on the right, we're really talking about a much smaller proportion of individuals who have um, a mental illness, and they will be offered um, maybe other types of first line care that have not yet been tried, or maybe even a second try of a first line therapy that wasn't tried in a, in a full trial, or go on to second or third line treatments. And the individual may have the opportunity to see several care providers, and this is where it can become complex and communications are of the utmost importance. Having a central medical record accessible to all health providers, whether it be pharmacy, psychology, psychiatry, social workers, and so forth, uh, to be able to see and communicate with each other efficiently is absolutely critical. So those were the main things that I wanted to cover today. Hopefully I've done um, a reasonable job sort of covering the frameworks of how we approach what constitutes um, an effective treatment for mental illness, what it's for, how we know it's working, and what we do when it's not working. And I just wanted to say that what's absolutely critical to supporting um, our use of any kinds of treatments is the quality of evidence uh, that's behind those treatments itself, such that we're making sure that we're availing individuals to high quality research based uh, tr treatment options before they go to other options that even if they're safe, they may be dangerous because the person may not get well. And if they're not getting well, that means they're at high risk of having uh, adverse outcomes. So that's all I had prepared. Uh, thank you very much for your time and interest. And I will find how to unshare quickly. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. Um, You're welcome. Fortunately, the senator is having a little um, technical difficulty, so maybe um, I will just say thank you. And there was a question that did come forward from Senator uh, Wu. Um, he was wondering, is there a need for changes in the Mental Health Act of some provinces to allow police and mental health professionals to commit individuals to psychiatric care without their consent? To bar um, to do so in some provinces seems too high and the expense of those who are clearly ill but not ill enough are related to questions as how we can ensure that a mental ill person who has become committed to one province but flees to another can be detained and given treatment despite different mental uh, health laws. I don't know if um, Dr. Tian, if you want to, you may just have to unmute yourself and then um, join. Uh, the microphone on the top right hand side of your thing there should be a little microphone with a line through it there oh yes uh, can you hear me yes there yep. you go. Uh, well, thank you senator that is um uh one of the most important issues we face uh, uh, and one of the most complex um the, the balancing of of um the rights of the individual, rights of people with uh, a mental disorder, severe persistent mental disorder in particular, and the um, need to protect them, first of all, but also to protect others in society if they have um, behavior that's threatening, is, you know, it, it, it's really difficult um, to legislate a, a clear way that. Uh, those that balance can be achieved. 
I would say, and you know, each province has an individual um, approach or individual legislation governing how uh, patients are detained involuntarily. Um, the trend um, has varied over the centuries and particularly over the last, uh, say, 50 years. Uh, and we, we are now in a stage where I think we have a reasonably good balance in most of the jurisdictions in Canada where um, we, we are able to intervene when somebody is visibly in need of care uh, without having to be at a very extreme end of, of uh, uh, causing danger to themselves and others. Most jurisdictions have introduced um, uh, less stringent requirements for, for that uh, to occur, uh, while at the same time maintaining and strengthening appeal mechanisms and um, supportive um, interventions by those who, who uh, advocate for the patient. Uh, and so I think we're in Canada at a reasonably good place. Uh, and we have advanced from a period in the 70s and 80s when it was extremely difficult um, to, uh, to admit somebody unless they were uh, at the very extreme end of the, of the spectrum. Um, but it, it's, it's a constant, constantly monitored situation, I think. And um, you, the, the number of times that each province changes their legislation is quite striking. Uh, this is not a, you know, something that is, is, is at a standstill once a, once a bill has been passed and a law proclaimed. Uh, it, there continues to be a monitoring of societal um, uh, sort of judgments on the um, on the balance that, that is achieved with uh, our mental health legislation. And uh, that's something I think will always be the case. It's, um, uh, it's not possible, I think, to arrive at, at uh, a completely static way of managing uh, this, this very significant problem. Th th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tian. And uh, I'm aware that uh, our time is coming to an end. I just have one question that was uh, provided uh, to um, for, for Dr. Gardner. Uh, and I just like to ask it before we sign off. Um, given that all the fake news I see on social media, uh, how do I know what uh, treatments are most likely to help or not? Uh, you know, I think everybody knows uh, there's a doctor out there called Dr. Google, and Dr. Google is a great source of all information. Um, unfortunately, it's rather unstructured and unfiltered. So um, what we do have is a great supply of healthcare providers and probably underutilized source to help you with that is your local pharmacist. You know, I do an awful lot of teaching to pharmacists and they're the most accessible uh, individuals for this kind of thing. Often you can ask your doctor this question, but sometimes it's a lot more convenient to give a call to the pharmacist. You don't even need to um, book an appointment. You don't need to uh, go to the pharmacy itself, but uh, call up the pharmacy and ask them about it. And they should be very happy to say, let me look into it and get back to you if they don't know the answer. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, cogent response. And uh, thank you. Um, uh, both of you for uh, taking the time to to to, to be here. Um, I just see one last question um, for um, from uh, uh, a participant. Uh, a long question. Um, I, basically, talking about uh, the importance uh, of uh, cultural competency in, in training uh, of uh, mental health professionals uh, and police, um, um, uh, in terms of, of the importance of that particular issue, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, professionals, uh, both first uh, responders and mental health professionals, uh, have uh, under good and deep understanding of different cultures. Maybe you could just end off with that, Dr. Tian. No, I totally agree. Um, and, uh, you know, it's part of the complexity of the training that's needed that not only is the mental illness uh, not fully understood by many first responders, but, but then the, um, the complexion of how illnesses present in different cultures uh, is a wide range and, um, and, and therefore 
additional training in that area, of course, is most important, yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks all for participating and for uh, staying on during this uh, time. It was uh, most illuminating. Um, thanks again, everyone, for your time. Uh, the session was recorded and uh, it will be available for people who wish to uh, have a chance to look at it again or to share it uh, with their colleagues. So uh, once again, thanks to Dr. Stian and Dr. Gardner. And thank you, uh, everyone, for taking the time to, to be here with us. Uh, on this Mental Illness Awareness Week, um, want to uh, also acknowledge the work that the Senate Mental Health Committee has been doing on uh, bringing a better and more cogent understanding of mental health and mental illnesses to our Senate community. And again, that's also a community that we want to increase for all parliamentarians um, uh, in the House and the staff in the House, uh, as well as here in the Senate. So once again, uh, Drs. Gardner and Tian, thank you so much uh, for, for your inputs. And uh, stay safe um, and uh, enjoy uh, the rest of the day. And the Thanksgiving weekend is coming up, so please stay safe during Thanksgiving and enjoy it the best we can. Thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bonne chance. Thank you.